Hello and welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I am your host as always, Steve Hall. This is part two with Martin McDonald from Mac Nutrition. Uh, and we are going to be talking about maintenance phases for the bodybuilder and for general population and why they're so important. And also talking about supplementation, how should your diet look, what supplements are good for general health and for sports performance. So look forward to that and I will talk to you shortly. Cheers make a good segue to the second point I wanted to go on to in which you talked about kind of maintenance phases and treating kind of your coaches teaching them to live as a goal um, I've recently had a client go through a period of maintenance after 15 weeks of dieting and he is like I didn't realize what normal actually felt like like I mm. thought that was normal this is like I feel so good right now what's wrong yeah, yeah. like I would just never even like this so do you want to talk a bit about more of kind of how do you get people to accept maintenance as a goal? Because I think especially if people listening to this, like bodybuilders, people interested in body composition changes, they hate the idea of maintenance because it sounds like they're standing still. And I try and teach it as like, right, you're taking like a step back to take three steps forward. It's kind of setting you up for future progress, but let your body settle, let it normalize a bit before we try and switch the goals. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, just touch on that a little bit. And um, yeah, it's something you definitely teach in your course, and so it was very interesting to me. Yeah, um, I'm just going to make a little. Uh, but I just wanted to say one extra thing that I, I kind of touched on and then didn't expand on because I was all over the shop. But is that the idea that the maximum calorie deficit, so that you don't take um, energy from lean body mass. When people hear lean body mass, they think muscle mass. Yep. And it's just, it's really important to remember that lean body mass in studies is not muscle. It's not necessarily myofibrillar protein being broken down and you are taking all of that lovely muscle gain and burning it up as energy. It's muscle glycogen. If you lose muscle glycogen, you are losing some lean body mass. And again, the associated water that goes with it. So, um, if you do, and, and this is, you know, the other area where I've been um, quite vocal um, is, I was trying to think of a better word than vocal, um, is the kind of aggressive phases of diets and aggressive days so that, you know, I've, I've written an ebook on intermittent fasting and, you know, intermittent fasting for me was a, is an absolute revolution based on my bro days of oh i've never put someone yeah. on 600 calories um and if you do a day at 600 calories and and the scenario i gave was then the next day at 2000 that 600 doesn't necessarily lead to muscle loss it leads to lean body mass loss or um the use of lean tissue energy i.e you will tap into glycogen stores and burn some of those up but when you go back to the 2000 calorie day your muscles if you think of them like a bucket you know you you tap into those and it's why you could eat in a surplus of you know 500 calories for four days and gain no body fat as long as you kept fat intake low is because you would literally just be topping up that store so that 2000 calorie day um is it becomes the you know the average is a true average because you are you know able to um lose body fat and then um essentially you are you know with with like non-insulin dependent glucose transport storing the glucose that you're eating very quickly and it becomes a, a kind of a deficit um over the two days so i just wanted to touch on that as well so with regards to maintenance it's you know, it, it's really funny talking to you because it's like when I'm often when I'm kind of teaching on MNU, like I'm super focused on gen pop coaching mm -hmm. as opposed to bodybuilder coaching. And we obviously have loads of um, kind of prep coaches doing MNU as well. So um, and, and, you know, we have, you know, the specific kind of we have three fat loss lectures, which kind of ticks all of the different types of clientele boxes nice. and um and I say three fat loss lectures, it's almost like a, a module on each of those lectures. And um, they, 
we also touch on kind of contest prep bodybuilding and, and on the online coaching stuff so when I talk about kind of coaching maintenance the way from the physique standpoint of coaching maintenance it's like the fact that we now know that you can gain muscle in a deficit just imagine how much better you know the the kind of the study that I'm sure loads of people will be aware of the long lens study where it's like um the deficit was kind of 1200 calorie deficit and again 2.4 i think that's the study grams per kilogram protein um and they gained muscle mm-hmm. and like yeah there's some nuances to that study with regards to um uh muscle memory type effects but we know physiologically it can occur regardless of the fact that oh you can only gain muscle in a deficit if you're on steroids it's like but we know physiologically something can happen those processes aren't like opposing processes a bit like the whole oh you shouldn't have caffeine with creatine because caffeine is a diuretic and creatine needs and it's like they aren't a two opposing processes you can take both at the same time both will work um so we we know this can occur so remove that 1200 calorie deficit from that group and imagine that's their maintenance imagine the muscle gain that they can achieve at that point Mm -hmm. so you the body works really freaking well at maintenance in terms of um you know even something as as kind of uh that I, i don't like people talking about too much but kind of the hormonal milieu that you are in at maintenance yeah is really good for muscle gain um and you know we know we can gain some in a deficit probably it's you know i'm gonna say definitely not the best way to maximize mm-hmm. your muscle being in a deficit um but it can be done maintenance is brilliant how much of a surplus is necessary for muscle gain much 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 less than i think most people think and i, I sort of talk about this again of natural bodybuilding sucks unless you are completely obsessed by it um because muscle gain is so freaking slow and therefore gaining a pound a month which again it's like i'm gonna go for half a pound a week that's like two pounds a month that's 24 pounds a year and you're gaining maybe one to four pounds of muscle in that year um but you feel freaking great because you're massive and it's like oh look all this muscle i've packed on it's like it's 20 the absolute maximum of your 24 pounds is four pounds of muscle 20 pounds of fat but i don't look 20 pounds fatter yeah lucky you you've distributed it evenly you've been weight training it feels good but my goodness it's going to be sucky to lose those 20 pounds of fat but it does feel good and it's again adherence you know bodybuilders i talk about them as like these neurotic losers and i you know i sort of involve myself in that (laughs) um it's like um it's a boring process it's but it's adherence is still an issue probably adherence is more of an issue bulking than it is on a deficit because it's like oh you know i feel a bit fat or i want to up my calories more i don't don't really know and if you go let's aim for half a pound a month a pound a month maybe because then it becomes almost measurable but even then it's really yeah. freaking difficult to measure a pound a month but a pound a month you gain 12 pounds of muscle in a year 12 sorry not 12 pounds a month so that'd be awesome 12 pounds of weight in a year and you've definitely been in a surplus and probably enough of a surplus realistically to maximize your muscle gain naturally um or even unnaturally it's not gonna make any difference like again one of the things that I know you don't necessarily want to go into, but it's like assisted bodybuilders don't need any more protein than a natural bodybuilder. Yeah. End of story. Um, and um, I would, I, I'm just saying that, so I, I hope I can just generate some someone trying to call me out, <laughs> out just with some extra content <laughs> sometime. But um, yeah, it's it, this whole what maintenance thing is during a deficit. Maintenance is amazing. Um, it's you know, because it's it's an increasing calories and though that really you know anabolic for your body and you know it will restore some of your metabolic adaptation your adaptive thermogenesis and um so during the bulk yeah i understand why people are a bit like oh it's um 
it's pointless i'm not going anywhere and uh, you know i wouldn't necessarily argue with that massively mm-hmm. but i wouldn't say you're not going anywhere at maintenance because you are gaining muscle if your training is on point and you know as hard as it is for me to say this training is so much more important than nutrition for muscle gain yeah. so if you're not gaining muscle your training's not right it's highly highly unlikely that your nutrition is the limiting factor like if your nutrition is rubbish yes but if you're just at least eating some protein it's your training that sucks um but then you know jumping to the gen pop maintenance stuff it's that's where i think it's unbelievably applicable and you know i've joked about the fact that i should write this ebook on um you know the weight weight maintenance diet and it's like yeah do whatever stupid diet you want to do to lose the weight um but all of you all of your different clans and crews and um fads you all have to then come and do my diet um you know do, do you lean in 15 if you really want but um then do my diet so um it's you know, the maintenance side of things, coaching people, you know, people go, oh, diets fail. Diet, you know, the industry is just a failure of diets. It's like, no, it's not. Diets freaking work. All of these stupid diets make people lose weight. Um, and they don't, it's not the diet themselves. It's the mentality that people went into it with. It's the fact that they did a shake diet with no coaching. Um, and they didn't know what to do. They didn't have an exit strategy. Yeah. And, you know, again, one of the reasons that I absolutely loved the concept of a reverse diet um, and the whole concept of reverse mm-hmm. dieting was when I was competing, it pretty much was an eating competition. Once <laughs> you finish the show, and I've said this, like I, my, my re- most ridiculous situation ever was gaining 29 pounds in nine days. Wow. And um, obviously, like water and food weight were involved with that. But I just was paralyzed with food for nine days because I didn't have an exit strategy. I had been completely disordered in the way I'd done everything. I had demonized food and all of this kind of stuff. No flexible approaches. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so exit strategies, weight maintenance, coaching your clients to live. Like you've just said there, someone going, oh my goodness, like, I had no idea this what maintenance felt like. Yeah. You you take a um, a weight loss client, someone who's dieted and, and rebound for years and years in a row, and someone who's a weight loss resistant individual, yeah. um, and you just put them on maintenance calories through decent food, and they go, oh, I can't possibly eat this much food. Oh, I feel so full, yeah. and they're like, you're on less calories than you were on. That's that's what maintenance calories is. If you eat well, if you eat some vegetables, if you eat some protein, um, and you de- you then get them to a point of they've basically gone through a bit of a starve binge cycle. They've hyper palatable foods. They're always hungry, and you put them in a deficit. And a deficit, no matter what it is, tends to make people kind of hungry. And mm-hmm. another reason I like aggressive dieting: five hundred calories or a thousand calories deficit. It sucks. It's a diet. <laughs> Um, so let's get it over with as quick as possible. Um, so, you know, this is why, again, with a whole evidence-based crowd, I'm saying, by, actually talk to your client if they can, because I was amazed when I said to clients, you know, how, how low can we actually go? And they're like, yeah, just, you know, I can do whatever. Um, and, um, so this kind of coaching to live thing, um, Picking a low deficit, getting it over and done with quickly, and um, yeah, it's kind of that's how I'm trying to teach people that maintenance is not something to shy away from, and um, you know, put someone in. Yeah, it's that thing of that person might if you chuck them into a deficit. And they've been on this kind of hyper palatable food, feeling hungry. They've already maybe got some metabolic adaptation because they've already come to you having lost a little bit of weight. Stick them on maintenance. Show them that they can live and eat good food. Build some lifelong habits at yeah. maintenance. And then go, right, we're going to do what's called a proper diet now, whatever that may look like. Um, jam them in a deficit. Oh, this is really good. I'm seeing results. I've got buy-in because I'm seeing quick weight loss. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're going to hop back to a maintenance because your adherence started to slip. Yeah. Now we're going to go again. Um, there we go. 
you know, I think that's, that's, I mean, this is exactly the experience I've had with the periods of maintenance I've put people through. I, I kind of call them primer, I call them primer phases. Cause I'm like, yeah. they prime you for whatever you're next trying to do uh, because you're now settled and it's completely true. You get those people, they yo-yo diet, they go up and down. And it's essentially this is like coming down, holding, coming down, holding. Um, because like you said, diet fatigue, which is kind of how I, I name it under, yeah, um, yeah. just builds up and it gets uncontrollable. And it happens, like I see it more and more of my clients after about like 15 weeks, if they adhere, adhere, their adherence starts slipping, slipping, even yeah. if we chuck in kind of the strategic refeeds or week long diet breaks, eventually they're like, right, I, ca I, like, I can't stick to this anymore. And we take an extended period off. And they maintain body composition or even like you said, you could potentially even improve your body composition in that time. And mm. I think like the, the reverse dieting approach, I actually have heard you talk about it before. And I, I don't know why in my head I was thinking, oh, Martin's going to hate upon this because a, a lot of people do hate upon it. And I think they think back to like the 10 grams of carbs, the five grams <laughs> yeah, of fat, which, exactly. which I think really everyone is. hates that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if you do the, the like tricking up calories like 100, 200 each week, like that's that's actually not bad as a bodybuilder and actually for a lot of even i've had female clients a lot of the time are a bit kind of scared of gaining weight and if they're coming to you and you want them to maintain that's an approach i've used where i've just like we've almost reversed and trickled up their calories rather than going straight to what i think their maintenance is yeah and they kind of accept and buy into it a bit more then but yeah. it's it's so hard to get people out of the habit of restrict and then like binge and purge and yeah. i think that's where the I mean, online it's quite difficult, but in person it's a lot easier because at least you can talk to the person. So at least we've got these kind of, I can send them this podcast, get them to look at what you've said and I can talk to them via, like I do video messages. Um, yeah. And I guess that's something you try and teach on your course as well, kind of how to relay it to a client so they understand. Um, and a big, I mean, you just look, say to them, what's happened in the past? Has that worked for you? Why have you come to me? Because you want something different that's hopefully going to provide you the result you want. So... No, I think that's really good teaching people to live. Um, do you have time for a final question? I know we're coming to that yeah. hour or we could just close it. We kind of come to a good stopping point. We could get you on again. What are you feeling? I, um, I, I've got another half hour if needed. So we, we can go on. I, I'm sure there's always more to talk about. So um, yeah, if you want to ask another one, then fire away. Okay, cool. I might as well use it while I've got you here. <laughs> um, so... The next question I had was, I think this is quite a general question that I think anyone listening to would really benefit from. And mm -hmm. I think this, like, there's examine.com, which is really useful for supplements. Um, and like people are here, like there's Holland and Barrett that are advertising all these different supplements. People are hearing about these different ones coming out. And at the end of the day, and I think I saw you write something about this. If you, if you have a good enough diet, and I think a lot of people have heard about this, if your diet is like, a, a good wholesome diet you shouldn't really need any of these supplements and what i kind of wanted to get from you is kind of what how, what could you are there any supplements you need to concern yourself with if you have a good diet in place and then from you what does a good diet mean like how does that actually look on paper because i think especially a lot of the listeners will be flexible dieters they probably have heard of like the 80 20 kind of 80 percent wholesome food 20 percent potential like preference um but yeah just the down low on supplements and what's what's maybe wanted and what we can not need if we have the right diet yeah cool um so <clears throat> yeah this is a an interesting one I, and it's cool that you've seen me say this somewhere else because i don't know where i've said that but it's um uh because i'm not an overly prolific writer but um i other than just kind of trolling facebook comments but it's not like I, I need to stop doing that and actually put out some decent length <laughs> stuff but um the yeah the area of supplements is it's one that annoys me a little bit with regards to um in the in the world of nutritional therapy and in the world of um kind of just nutritionism uh, a lot is the the idea that certain supplements so talking vitamin minerals to begin with is Oh, you're lacking energy. Yeah, B, vit, uh, B vitamins are good for yeah. that. Oh, um, you know, like even just ridiculous stuff like, oh, boost your testosterone with zinc sort yeah. of thing. And, and like um, all of these kind of things. It's essentially if you get a client, 
eating a half decent diet it should be correcting a lot of if they have nutritional deficiencies or whatever it should be correcting those um and i I will go on to that in a bit and you know the the absolute maximum really in the world of vitamins and minerals that you need is a basic multivitamin and mineral and i don't mean basic necessarily like a cheap um sort of supermarket one like it it does pay to um maybe spend a tiny bit more just because of the bioavailability of some vitamins and minerals so something like zinc oxide is very very poorly absorbed and bioavailable um in humans and therefore getting kind of there's lots of different um options um kind of chelated versions and um zinc piconate and gluconate and acetate and they're all a slightly more um, bioavailable or a lot more sorry bioavailable to be accurate mm-hmm. um but but once you're taking that there is literally no point in all of these mega dosing of like oh you know you see some of these people post their supplement regimens on or, or like their instagram stories with a handful of like oh i'm taking this and this and this and um so yeah the vitamin mineral stuff like the the herbal stuff is all just kind of wacko jacko i don't i'm not even really going to go there with regards to supplements um and then the the realistic the i mean the funny scenario is fish oils are have a lot of good evidence behind them yeah. um the you know within we know that they're really important in certain clinical situations we know they're important in things like pregnancy um and uh, vitamin d is another one that i'll talk about but it's funny because in our evidence-based world it's like oh yeah fish oils yeah they're they're like evidence-based they're good they've got all this good efficacy behind there um and then you get someone who comes to you going like yeah i have um mackerel for for lunch and I have salmon for dinner and then people hmm. are like cool the supplements you should take are fish oil and it's like no yeah and and i'm not saying that at all judgmentally to anyone because i did the same thing like i had but i had clients this is going back to in my early 20s but i had people who i was helping and they were eating like mackerel daily and i was like take two fish oils a day <laughs> as well. and it's like there's literally no point in doing that um but myself now i know something about nutrition but that doesn't mean my nutrition is always on point and i can categorically say in the last two years that i have not eaten fish um the you know even the kind of basic health guidelines of twice a week so i therefore take some fish oil um and therefore if your client is someone who if unless you are specifically giving them like a tick sheet make sure you're having oily fish this many times a week and a portion this size and that's going to get them their epa and dha where we want it to be then maybe just taking a you know a gram of fish oil a day is a nice fail safe mm-hmm. um so you know if you're providing with some them some macros and some guidelines and whatever and you they're like picking their own food choices you, you're not checking food diaries weekly or whatever yeah there's going to be no issue with getting a a fish oil and taking that daily um the other one is obviously vitamin d country dependent Mm -hmm. race or skin color dependent sun exposure dependent but certainly for your uk listeners or like basically for anyone who works in an office who doesn't go outside a lot who puts loads of sun cream on when they go in a sun like vitamin d deficiency is something that we now know is hugely prevalent um, any of your Irish listeners, you are definitely <laughs> vitamin D efficient. Um, so the, the highest vitamin D levels I've ever seen um, in a client was an Irish track athlete who was on training camp in South Africa. And he came wow. back and he tested him. So it's like, yeah, he was made for the Irish sun. And then you put him in South Africa for a month. <laughs> and uh, his his levels were through the roof. So, um, but then like football players, you've got you know black football players playing in in the UK, um, you know, with a, in a strip with long sleeves, and it's like they're so vitamin D deficient. Um, so vitamin D is a big one um, that we tend to use quite often. And then other than that, then it comes down to your performance supplements. Realistically, yeah. like health supplements, those three I've mentioned, I literally cannot think of another other thing 
that I've ever used on a regular basis. Um, can you think of anything that I might be missing? So you said vitamin D, omega threes, and the other one you mentioned was a multivitamin. Multivit. No, I think I those don't... those are the standard kind of yeah. They're Good. the ones I I mean same as me. I would recommend Good. those at most. Yeah. I know you would tell me if I was missing something. <laughs> so, and then performance stuff. Then, the, unfortunately, the performance list of supplements is incredibly short as well, but it's slightly longer. Um, but you know, realistically, whey protein is probably unnecessary. But I don't mm -hmm. even class it as a supplement. It's yeah. like a sports food or a convenience food. Um, but you've got your creatine. You've got and and basically just use monohydrate. Do not use anything else um, because the chances. Are that it might not work like with creatine ethyl ester when that came out we know that probably doesn't work yeah. despite all of the heavy marketing of oh it's loads better and doesn't cause the water bloat and blah 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 you only need to take half the amount and um, the reason it doesn't cause the water bloat of course is because it degraded to creatinine really quickly and you weren't increasing <laughs> creatine stores in the muscle so um that was an unfortunate study when that came out for the suppliers um so creatine caffeine obviously we know great for all sorts of different performance from long distance stuff to um you know gym stuff high intensity interval training stuff um you know team sports um often hugely underdosed um in an acute sense chronically it's probably overdosed yeah. with people drinking coffee from dawn until dusk and screwing up their sleep and which is really really bad um but acutely, you have people going, oh, I'm going to have one Red Bull. Oh, yeah, I'm on it. And it's like you don't realize that you're miles away from the efficacious dose of caffeine. But, yeah, it gives you a little kick. And actually, I think it's a lot of a placebo then yeah. because people take – you know, I know as soon as I have a sip of um, my white, red, or yellow monster, yeah. those new calorie-free ones that they've done that are amazing, one sip and I'm like, oh, I'm rejuvenated. Um, and it's like – it's, the caffeine's not hit my system yet. Mm -hmm. So caffeine, creatine, um, beta alanine is probably one of the ones which we now are classing as an, an, a class A supplement. Okay. Uh, it's up there with decent efficacy. Um, not on an acute basis, but probably on a uh, using for training, augmenting training adaptations. And then um, creatine, caffeine beta alanine and i think the only one and this other is sodium bicarbonate which you know is like for making cakes but we know that it's a, a lactic buffer and it's probably underused but unfortunately it comes with certain side effects and um, being kind of gi distress mm -hmm. and um, but again you know it's it's hugely underused and i certainly underused it with athletes i worked with because it's it's not a fun or tasty or convenient or low risk supplement but yep. probably there were times i should have used it um other than that anything else you are clutching at straws um citrulline malates getting some mm -hmm. um a little bit of backing and i do talk okay. and you talk about these and i sort of say look if you've got a highly compliant client highly adherent um, high motivation. They are a blue personality type because we go into that stuff. We write a behavior change and cool. counseling, and um, they, you know, they do well with data. They need some, um, you know, and also like the, the kind of yellow personality type, which we talk about some cool client case studies that we had, and um, almost our poster case studies of how we managed to get much better effects with someone because we did this with them. But again, people who, again, I talk about this sometimes with bulking. If you are a prep coach, you can always get people to pay you to help them prep for a show. But it's really freaking hard to get them to pay you for their off season. Yeah. So it's because off season is kind of boring and it's a bit similar and it's a bit samey. But if you can, in, you do some things and you're not trying to rip them off, but you are trying to help them with adherence, you're keeping them accountable. You're, you're, again, I, I've heard um, prep coaches say, if these fipping clients came to me, rather than 12 weeks out or 20 weeks out, they came to me nine months out, I could get them in the best possible yeah. place to start their diet. And you know, we talk about this thing of, okay, you've got this person who's on it with everything, actually maybe trying some citrulline malate with that person, some carnitine, um, El tartrate, some of these types of things. Um, if they do nothing, I would recommend you not to be making money through giving them to people because I think that there's a fine line between mm -hmm. in regards to integrity. But 
they're super cheap. Give them that. You know, even if it's the placebo, the placebo is, an, is the best supplement out there. Um, so those are two that are kind of probably fringe type supplements. Um, even I'd probably class HMB in and around that. I obviously hate the made-up <laughs> data regards to HMB, but you know, forgetting that, it might be something during overreaching periods that might have an effect. Um, mm -hmm. Other than those, nothing really. So based on what a healthy diet is, it's it's the diet that I'm sure you espouse to everyone. It's this thing that is made up of, you know, it's like, oh, you're a flexible diet. To you, you're in, you know, I'm I'm a proponent of flexible dieting, and if it fits your macros as a concept but obviously not the stupid versions of yeah. them. So you said about the 80-20, and that can be any rule of the 90-10, 70-30. Yeah. But, you know, as long as almost, I, I, this isn't evidence-based, but I sort of talk to people about, let's look at BMR and maybe BMR times DAF, daily activity factor, or PAL, physical activity. Mm -hmm. Get your wholesome calories to equate to your BMR. Mm -hmm. And then if you do physical activity and and then exercise energy expenditure to give us our TDEE, total daily energy expenditure, those exercise calories can be your flexible ones. And if you want them to come from Pop-Tarts, then knock yourself out. But as long as this is coming from wholesome, a range of foods, um, you know, I, I'm not going to patronize your listeners by telling them what the good, wholesome, unprocessed foods are. But it's all of those good ones. Um, and, and also, I just suppose the one thing, the only thing, I hate the word moderation, but I love the words balance and variety okay. in that look at your actual diet and think, is it really varied? Like, are your protein sources varied? Like, I'm not talking about the stupid bro science of if you eat chicken, you'll become allergic to it. <laughs> no, it's are you actually, you know, is all of your meat coming from chicken? Do you eat any red meat? Mm -hmm. You know, are you, um, are you actually eating some fish? Uh, are you, do you only eat broccoli or you're getting a range of vegetables, a range of fruits, a range of nuts? You know, you get these people eating wholesome diets, but it's literally chicken, broccoli, almonds, pop tarts. Um, what have I missed? Apple, you know, and it's like, oh, look at this. 80 you know 2000 calories of wholesome food it's like you're eating four foods mm -hmm. or six foods including your pop tarts and whatever the other one was. so yeah just variety and balance within there as well and when we're talking when we do talk about like if you were doing like a meal plan approach because i know if there's bodybuilders listening sometimes they find that structure for periods of time really helps yeah. them adhere especially if they've got like a lot going on yeah. How long do you feel, if you were to put, I'm sure there's no data on this, but how yeah. long if you were to put a time period, could someone stick to like very samey nutrition and get kind of get away with it until they need to kind of get some more variety? And is there, is there a length of time you'd kind of be like, if you go for much longer than that, I think you're going to see some deficiencies settle in. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, that's a really good question. And something that I probably, I may have never taught actually. So um I should probably make a mental <laughs> note, put this somewhere within some extra bonus content on MNU. Um, is we one thing that I've done in the past with the people who really, really, really need that structured approach and um, you know find that better, f you know, because it, it's flipping bodybuilding is hardcore, isn't it? It's like really difficult. Mm -hmm. It's willpower to the max, um, and the more simplistic you can make your life, the better sometimes. And so I've tried to use some very very simple methods within there such as okay your evening meal let's take we in that meal we are going to rotate between like a fatty you know slightly less lean source of protein so we're going to rotate between our salmon beef and beef for instance and then maybe in that meal i'd say and then you've got a white fish or meat option and add this fat sauce to it some olives or some avocado yep. those are your three types of um meals in the evening so straight away there i've pretty much given them the maximum amount of variety that they need without going really flexible you know nice. choose what you want it's like you know rotate between oily fish red meat and you know once you get to the last 
four to eight weeks of a really hardcore diet, you can't just go, oh, I'll have mints here and I'll have some salmon there because the fat content of these varies you know, massively. And you might need to go, I need visible fats, I need visible protein, I need, you know, so that's a, that's a, a, a short term thing. And, you know, again, this is why the multivitamin mineral um, type scenario is fantastic yeah. because it's definitely not um, a substitute for a varied diet. Uh, I say definitely not. It's very, very highly likely not yeah. a substitute. And and the problem is, is we don't have the data on some of the bioactive compounds within whole foods that are probably part of the longevity of um, non-westernized populations and, and you know, the blue zone type populations. Um, so we, we have that rotation within dinner. And then, you know, our lunchtime, we've got, okay, what, you know, what variety really is there within white meats? You know, with regards to the nutrient profile, it's like pff, chicken, turkey, like tilapia, obviously, we know is a very <laughs> important bodybuilding food. But what's the realistically the difference in their foods with regards to, you know, oh, turkey's got 15 milligrams more potassium in it. It's like <laughs> ridiculous. So, um, you know, give or take there. But then I might say, you know, your lunch and your dinner vegetables have to be different. So you can't have broccoli and broccoli. You have to have whatever you choose. Um, and then realistically, there isn't any data on this, so I can't say. Yeah. But I'm going to go out on a limb and, and you know, no, no one ever calls me out because they're crybabies and they're scared. <laughs> but um, well, if they do, it's behind my back. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say, you could do a three, four, five, six month diet on what I've described there. Cabbage at um, lunch, spinach at dinner, those rotations on meat sources, carbohydrate again, you you know, if you're, I'm always using rice, you know, maybe it's like four weeks of rice and then four weeks of this or whatever. But again, you could just do, I'm going to have, um, rice at this one and, and potato at this one or, or whatever you want um and then yeah and then obviously i've missed out kind of breakfast and, and fruit and uh, maybe some nuts as the fat source whatever but with regards to that that's a relatively stringent diet um but actually has a has all you know more variety than most definitely most of the general population have yeah and um you know you're not missing a great deal there and it's like again if you're buying these bags of mixed veg and you're just popping them in the boiling or popping them in the microwave it's like you've got mixed veg it's like i've got four or five different vegetables in my stir fry chicken that i'm having as that evening meal mm -hmm. um so yeah um does that is that an adequate answer for you no, I think that was really, really good. And uh, yeah. I think you know, it was funny in listening to it. I was like, that sounds more variety than like people I know who are friends who aren't in the fitness industry at all. And just like they basically yeah. eat the same things very similarly day to day. And I think yeah. if you're doing that and that's something I've talked about before is kind of like you said, almost having like maybe you have a meal plan for certain meals. And then in the evening is like your flexible meal. You just make up what's left and try and vary that. So I thought that was a really interesting approach and kind of, yeah, finding rather than attacking the question of how long can you go without any variety, attacking it more like how can you insert variety in a structured way? I think that was a really good way of kind of describing the process. That was brilliant. Great. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I think we'll close it there because I'm conscious of taking too much of your time. And I mean, I'm sure we could chat for ages and maybe we can get you on again. I'm sure people will request you to come on again because... I think actually at the start you talked about how you really like speaking. People say you're a very good speaker and you explain things in a really digestible and easy way. You certainly do. Um, and there's a few people I've listened to on podcasts who I search out purposely and you're definitely one of them. So I think it's a skill that might just be innate that you haven't practiced, but it's a brilliant <laughs> skill that you have. So yeah, thank you for sharing everything. And for the listeners who are kind of interested to learn more, I know we've talked about, and I know I'm going to have everything in the description box below, but if you just wanted to give them some places to, if they could reach out to you or find most of your content, where would you like them to go, Martin? Yeah, best places for me are, um, sorry, can you hear that buzzing noise? Only slightly. <laughs> just one second. <laughs> So
sorry about that. That's a no very uh, cuff. Um, someone ringing the office things and everyone in the um, all my staff being lazy, not doing anything. Um, so yeah, best place to get me realistically is um, is social media. So I, I did a post the other day about hitting my five thousand friend limit on Facebook. A bit of a tongue in cheek oh, post nice. about how I'd hit the heights of success. <laughs> and, um, but uh, yeah, you can obviously, if people are that interested, they can just click the, the follow button on there. And I, I do spend a lot of my time on social media. Um, I use it as a learning tool myself. I use it as a, you know, interacting with people. I, you know, just, it's something I massively enjoy talking about nutrition as hopefully came across in the, in the podcast and um, kind of dispelling myths. And so anywhere people want to follow my work, I, it's, it, I'm not one of these great people, you know, even like yourself, you put out good content in articles. Like I just, I used to love writing. Um, and you know, on macnutrition.com, you can look at my, you know, really, really early work, but probably in the last, I don't even know now, four years I've, I've published very, very little, if anything, but obviously, you know, appear on podcasts and, um, obviously had my, my own podcast, Real Nutrition Radio, which I know you, you said you'd listen to a little bit. And, you know, just t- from a time perspective, it, I, I'm sure you know, like you obviously put a lot of e- kind of effort into, into your podcasting. And for me, just rocking up here today and having you lead it is so much less <laughs> stressful than having to do it myself. Um, so, yeah, I, I suppose I always post up if I've been asked to appear on a podcast and do those things. But the, you know, you mentioned it, macnutrition.com is our consultancy. We're not taking on clients, but there's some some free um, articles that I've written on there um, and uh, a little ebook. My personal website is martin-macdonald.com. Please never visit that on a mobile phone. I'm currently trying to employ a web developer. Um, so if anyone wants a job as a web developer, <laughs> contact me um the pay's good and um we yeah I, i'm getting that redone at some point i don't 100 percent know what i'll do with it but there is my free intermittent fasting for single digit body fat ebook on there that people can get i don't actually you know like people do these ebooks and they build this email list and yeah. then they send them emails um i have never sent an email to the email <laughs> list on my website which has been there forever um, so it's, it, I will at some point maybe send those people an email to say hello and have they heard of Mac Nutrition Uni, which okay. is probably the best place for people to go and just pop their email into that. And yes, we will send you the occasional thing saying we're opening our enrollments. And, you know, if that's not for you, you can just delete it and move on. But, we, you know, mostly we give out free lectures. I gave out a, basically a lot of our behavior change lecture. And again, I had people tweeting me saying, oh my goodness, like this is amazing content I've made. Well, I think we gave out about a quarter of the, the course and she was like, I've made wow. four pages of notes on, on that. And you know, I think it's her area of study as well. <laughs> um, and you know, I give out talks from expos. I gave out my talk from body power this year and, um, you know, it, it, it's free content. And, you know, for people who, you know, we've got lots of subscribers on there who just are general population, never want to do our course. But, you know, I sent a, a Christmas present out on Christmas Day for one of our module one lectures. Um, and again, I said to people, look, as sad as I am, if you reply to this email, I sent it on Christmas Day. I typed it on Christmas Day. You know, when everyone's like, oh, you should be with family. It's like, yeah. what are you doing right now? It's like you're sitting on the couch watching... <laughs> I don't know, Father Christmas movies. And it's like, yeah, I was just chilling in the afternoon and I thought, I want to write this email. And, um, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a huge TV watcher and, you know, got loads of replies back of people going, I, I watched that, you know, on, on boxing day and, um, it was really cool to watch it. And so we do give out free content there. So, um, yeah, basically social media, I, I'm on Instagram as well, but again, I find Instagram's mainly for morons. Um, <laughs> obviously i'm on there as well so i'm one too but it's difficult to know people i don't think people read anything on instagram it's just for pictures and i'm not particularly nice to look at so it's what have i got it's mainly my, my children and just funny anecdotes on there but yeah so at martin nutrition is pretty much my handle on everything and um and those websites so uh yeah so Brilliant. so that's me what you need to do, Martin, is start these infographics that I've been trying and everyone's doing now. Um, employ someone to do infographics for things or maybe even post, if you've got graphics with your MNU content, post those on there and uh, that might attract some people in. 
Yeah, I should do that. I should, I should get better at it. I just need to. I need to employ a graphic designer after a web developer. So um, when we get that done, I'll do that. Awesome. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll catch you soon.